Hello, I'm Eric Citrenbaum, and this is the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group's COVID model projections for July 13th, 2022. Now, over the last four months, we have still been producing reports, in fact, four of them, but I have not been producing videos, but I am back at making videos now, just on the cusp of our next Omicron BA5 wave, and I will tell you about that in this report. So here's our overview of who we are. Uh, I will not say much about it other than that we are a group of independent modelers and data scientists working to understand the pandemic. Uh, here's the overview of our report. So um, I will say something about current trends in COVID-19 in BC. Um, comment on the rise of BA4 and BA5 and the implications of spread of those variants for uh, COVID-19 cases. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, hospital admissions data. So in here, there's uh, some modeling from both Sally Otto and Dean Carlin. And then I'll say a few words about the, um, the BA5 wave, which is just starting here in BC. So the summary then is that the next Omicron wave, the third one after BA1 in January, BA2 in April, we are now on the cusp of the BA5 wave, which is just starting to take off. Uh, BA5 is a fast spreader. Uh, we're predicting that the number of infections and hospitalizations are going to rise through the next month. And uh, the height of the BA5 wave and its impact are challenging to predict. Okay, so uh, current trends. Looking back here, this is going all the way back to September 2020, but just to orient you a little bit, you can see here in January, February, March is the Omicron wave that we, the first Omicron wave, BA1 variant. And then uh, as it tailed off Omicron 2, the BA2 wave started kicking in. And then now, after having seen the tail end of the BA2 wave, we are now looking at a new, so hospitalizations here are flattening and admissions, oh, this is ICU, yeah. Uh, and cases are now starting to turn around and um, increase again. So here's an update on the wastewater trends in Metro Vancouver. So um, I've heard a few different conversations now about the wastewater data. And um, the take home for me is that the wastewater data is noisy and tricky. And um, there are many complications and it really needs some careful analysis. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have access to all of the raw data that we would need and so it would be great if that raw data was available and could be used to build better models to try and decipher what's going on in this data as it is you can see that it's you know pretty noisy at times uh, in this trace here you kind of can convince yourself that you see the decline of the first Omicron wave in back in January and February, you can see in April a rise of the second Omicron wave. And now in July, you can see a rise, which is this upcoming BA5 wave. Now without other evidence, I'm not too sure I would try and make that claim um, just based on this because there are upticks that are kind of mysterious, like these things here and what's going on here and this and this, but anyway. All right, so let's look at some other data. Well, this is uh, the Facebook data that we've included in our reports before. Unfortunately, the survey is being discontinued, so up until June 25th, that's the end of our data, but you can see here a pretty good signal for the two Omicron waves that we've seen so far. So um, of the three different data sets that I'm uh, you know, telling you about, the first one is the uh, testing data when we're not doing testing anymore. This is the data that we flush down the toilet and this is Facebook data. Now, if anybody had told me 10 years ago that we would be using Facebook data for um, model projections of a pandemic, uh, I don't know what I would have told you. All right, so the rise of Omicron BA4 and BA5. These guys have some mutations in the spike protein 
this is a whole collection of uh, spike mutations that are common or not common to the BA um, family members here. And the important thing to take home from all this is that there's two mutations here that have been associated both with an increase in infectivity and uh, avoidance of antibodies. So this, this pair of new variants, BA4 and BA5, um, it's, there's reason to believe that they will be better in, at infecting cells, more rapid spreaders, and they will also be possibly better at evading immune responses that exist already from previous infections or from the vaccine. Data from South Africa tells us that BA4 has a selective advantage of 8% and BA5 has a selective advantage of 12%. So a selective advantage is a way of describing how these two grow relative to another variant, and in this case it's the BA2 that we're comparing to. Uh, and what it means is that if, let's say, the BA2 variant is just cruising along and not spreading it, it's sort of growing at a 0% rate, then we would expect BA4 to grow at 8% per day and BA5 at 12% per day. And so what's actually going on right now is BA2 is actually on the decline. So the growth rates that we're seeing in BA4 and BA5 are going to be less than 8 and 12% because those are the advantage over a declining number. All right, enough about that. Um, so, and this spread is again, a combination of higher transmissibility as well as immune evasion. How much of each uh, is going on there is not clear. All right, uh, what's going on in Canada? We're getting similar numbers here, you know, somewhere around eight and 12 for the two. And um, if you try and figure out based on, you know, previous data, what would be happening right now, greater than 80% of cases currently in Canada ought to be BA5. So looking at some of the provinces across Canada, we're seeing roughly similar uh, percentages. Instead of 8 and 12% for the two, they vary a little bit, as you can see through here. And some of these vary quite a bit, but possibly due to low numbers. All right. What are the implications of the spread of BA4 and BA5 for COVID-19 cases? So let's do a little bit of modeling here. So what Sally Otto has been doing for a little while and is continuing to do here is uh, hope that the 70 plus data, so that is individuals over the age of 70 who have been tested possibly somewhat consistently over the last few months, although that's becoming more of a sort of debatable claim. Um, if, if that's a, sort of a, a solid baseline and the rest of the population is just not really getting sampled very well, um, she's using this 70 plus data and, uh, you know, sort of correcting it based on age distribution to come up with a total case number across Canada. You know, even if you're, you don't believe that that's a reasonable thing to do, at least it seems pretty clear that recently there has been an upturn among the 70 plus and they will probably be the group that is most largely reflected in severe cases in hospitals and whatnot. So this is some kind of an indicator of what might be happening, uh, even if you don't believe this correction trick. So there is an uptick going on right now and we see that across the province on the whole and across the province in each of these regions, you can see this uptick at the end. Um, <clears throat> so what does this tell us for, for case numbers? So what, what Sally's done here is she's taken the, um, the frequency data that we're you know, getting out of the, um, the selective advantage calculations and using that in combination with the 70 plus cases, which is in green, to fit a model and project it forward. So you can see here, based on all of the frequency data, she's breaking out the BA1, BA11, BA2, and BA45 numbers. And you can see here that BA2 is coming down. And the only reason this red curve turns around is because the BA4, the orange bit is pushing it up. You can see this is getting smaller. So that really is tapering off and the BA4.5 is growing. What are the rates on that? Well, the combination of BA4 and 5 is rising at about 6% and 
given that the selective advantage is somewhere around 8 to 12, you can subtract that off and you should get decreasing at something between, let's say, 4, minus 4 and minus 6. So that would be the decay rate of the BA2 variant in there. So basically, you know, Sally is predicting that we're going to see a particular increase over the next little while of 6% 6, 6 per day. Uh, so looking at uh, this same calculation across the provinces, we see similar R values all hovering around 6, maybe a little bit lower um, in some provinces. This doubling time here is not to say that it will double over the next 12 days because the, it's, it's very possible that R will change as immunity builds. Um, but this is just to give you a rough idea of how quickly it's growing if, if the percentage per day is not a meaningful number for you. All right, so the conclusion here is that the third Omicron wave has started in Canada. We're going to call it the BA5 wave because it is the fastest component, faster than BA4, and will probably be the dominant one in very little time. All right, so um, we're going to move over to uh, hospital admission data and see what Dean Carlin's modeling says about the pandemic using that as a data source. So in Quebec, what Dean is showing here is um, his model fit to the hospital admissions data with three different variants built into it, the BA1, BA2, and BA, what he's calling BA45, group together. And um, one of the interesting points that he's drawing from this analysis is that, um, th that he has to now introduce, uh, in order to fit all three of these, these waves, he has to introduce some loss of immunity, whether that's by waning or by uh, immune evasion. In the modeling, he's implementing it by waning just because that's a simpler thing to do. But, um, but the point is that unless he brings the waning down to a range of 80 to 160 days, so if the waning period or the loss of immunity is minimal, you build up too much immunity and you can't continue with the current trend. It just doesn't work. And so this is uh, an, you know, an argument from him to, to support the claim, which we saw from the spike data, you know, the, the mutant, mutant information earlier on, that, uh, that there is some change in immunity over these waves. And here we see similar analysis for Alberta and Manitoba, which basically he's finding that these provinces are about a month behind where Quebec is. And finally, for BC, where the data is a little bit shakier, but we're also seeing something uh, similar. And he's confirmed that our May 18th report, uh, which was predicting or you know assessing that uh, hospital admissions had peaked, that was actually correct. In other words, that we had already seen a turnaround in the second Omicron wave. So that's good confirmation that the modeling that he's doing using the hospital admissions is capturing the trend. Okay, this is a, a, a sort of a check of his modeling. So in orange, you can see what his model thinks is the infected fraction of the population across Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec, and BC. And you can see that the CITF seroprevalence, so that's data collected from blood donors to check to see if they've got any evidence of having been infected with COVID-19. And you can see in Alberta, Dean's model is running a little bit high compared to the CITF data, um, as it is in Quebec, although there's not a lot of data there to compare to. And in Manitoba, it's hitting it pretty dead on. And in BC, it's doing pretty well also. Uh, in the U.S., <clears throat> so this is an example from Michigan. So, um, so I think the highlight here is um, not so much that Dean is trying to make a case about what's happening in Michigan, but using it to illustrate that his model is capturing immunity correctly. So what I mean by that is he's got a prediction based on the hospital admissions data. He builds a prediction for what's going to happen before the turnaround. And now looking back at what actually happened, he sees that his model was capturing the changes in immunity correctly. 
There's no breakpoint here where he changes transmission. This is just the model correctly assessing the trend and then projecting it forward and seeing the data line up with that as it comes out over the next few months. So that is a good confidence builder that his model is capturing, again, capturing a trend correctly. So what can we say about the impact of the BA5 wave? What can we expect? So in the next few slides, I'm going to go through some factors that uh, tell us a little bit about where we're at in terms of protection against infection and against uh, severe disease. So um, first question is, you know, what is the antibody seen like in the, pr the province? Um, and how good are these antibodies now at protecting us? Uh, what measures do we have in place currently um, for reducing the risk that we're facing? Uh, and then on the severe disease question, um, you know, there's antibody immunity and there's also cellular immunity, which is helpful for clearing infection as opposed to blocking for, from getting in. So what is the status of any immunity we've built uh, now against BA4 and BA5? And uh, just what's the evidence on how severe infections with these uh, subvariants are? So let's take a look at what we know about antibody levels. So this is from the CITF data. Uh, what I'm showing here in this slide is broken down by age. So here's 17 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 59, 60 to 69, and 70 plus. What you see from, this is September 2001 up till May 22, you can see that um, this sort of, what do they call this, a violin plot, you can see that represents the distribution of antibody levels. So a look across a, a sample of the population, and you can see that there was you know, some specific antibody level, and that antibody level went, so you can see it's sort of decreasing, but then it goes through a sudden jump here in early January, February, early in the year, and that was driven by the first Omicron wave, so an increase in those antibody levels. And you can see some people were at low antibody levels and others were at high based on who got infected and who didn't. And here there's waning after the first Omicron wave and a slight uptick during the second Omicron wave. So this is a bit of a technical slide. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but you can work through it if you're familiar with some of the terminology here. Um, and uh, ideas. Um, but the take home is that as far as the efficacy of neutralizing antibodies, these studies suggest that um, these antibodies are no, n not as good at neutralizing the virus and, and thereby preventing infection. So that means BA4 and BA5 are better at avoiding your antibody um, protection layer. So what's the story right now with risk reduction measures now that we're on the cusp of uh, the next wave? So first, let me just emphasize that um, risk reduction behaviors by this, I mean masking and seeking out well-ventilated spaces, distancing from people and keeping aware of what the overall prevalence of the disease is. These are all effective in reducing individual risk. An interesting observation here is that um, risk redu reducing behavior can be more effective during the upswing of a wave than during the downturn. And that's because earlier in a wave, there's lower immunity. So if you are cautious, you're removing exposure to a larger number of people than if you do it later. Um, so that's something to think about as we enter a new wave here. So the public health measures currently in place in BC are at the lowest they've been uh, in terms of stringency. Most have been removed. There's very little uh, left on the, on the books. Um, but that's not to say that the risk is not rising and falling as we have these waves. So I think it's important for people to remember that, um, you know, if you are concerned about getting infected or about, uh, you know, people around you that are vulnerable getting infected, um, it's, uh, it's still wise to, you know, uh, carry out all the, the methods of protection that we've been encouraged to use previously throughout the pandemic. And in fact, this type of uh, sort of uh, soft influence, uh, you know, instead of in place of mandates, just uh, setting social expectations and norms ourselves is quite effective. And I think these should be tagged not to whether our, um, our public health authorities tell us it's time to wear masks or not, but rather our own assessment 
of, uh, of the risk. It would be nice if there was a public health um, index in place that could tell us when the risk was high or not, but um, that's what we're trying to do with these videos. And here comes another wave. And so maybe in the next month or so, this is a time for people to start um, demonstrating that, uh, that concern for, uh, for public health themselves. So the next factor, uh, clearing of infections. So, um, so vaccines not only trigger your body to produce uh, antibodies that can coat virus and prevent them from getting into cells, they build memory in T and B cells that are capable of making more antibody and also killing infected cells. So this is uh, like a, a, a system that's better at getting rid of an infection once it's taken hold rather than blocking it from getting in. And so that has proven to be still effective. The, you know, the vaccines are effective on that front, even if the antibody effect is not as strong. And so, um, so this study that we're showing here found that uh, relative to the unvaccinated, those who had a two dose vaccine series were three times less likely to experience severe disease. And um, that protection rose to about 10 times for people with a recent booster or with vaccine plus a recent infection. But this is uh, not yet data for BA5. Uh, next factor is the virulence. So um, relative severity of BA5 is not known. Um, but this uh, plot here is showing some data from a UK uh, technical briefing where they estimated the um, uh, hospitalizations per infection over time. And there's, you know, some complications in this data, but you can see that, you know, alpha, there was a rise in hospitalizations and then the vaccine rollout brought that, um, that risk of hospitalization down, but Delta brought it back up again, Omicron brought it down, and now big question marks here, uh, is this coming back up again? So is it too late to get a booster to avoid COVID-19 during the BA5 wave? No. So if you, uh, if you haven't gotten your, your, your first booster, um, there's good evidence to indicate that it will increase your protection is a pretty rapid effect that these boosters have. So just because the BA5 wave has started uh, doesn't mean that uh, a booster isn't going to protect you from catching it during the upstroke of that wave. And if you're uh, eligible for a fourth booster and can do that, um, that is not on this graph, but it's you know likely to be also a good way to increase your protection. So here's just a message for people who are at risk of severe disease and who have not had their boosters. Doing so can r reduce your risk of hospitalization by about threefold. So the key message is the next Omicron wave has started in BC and across Canada. It's driven by the spread of the BA5 variant, subvariant, uh, currently predicted to be at around more than 80% of cases in the province or in the country. The selective advantage of BA5 over BA2 has been high and similar across the provinces, about 12% per day, which is why we're seeing a growth in BA5, even though BA2 is tapering off. Um, so as correctly predicted in our previous reports, the BA2 wave was smaller than the BA1 wave, despite its transmission advantage over BA1. This lower peak was due to enhanced immunity from boosters and natural immunity from BA1 infections. Um, with waning immunity, increased potential for BA5 to evade immunity, hospital admission, hospital admissions are expected to return to growth in BC and Alberta as observed already in Ontario and Quebec and several US states. So projections about the impact of the BA5 wave on severe cases, hospitalizations, and death are difficult given the uncertainty in population immunity to the new variants and about the risk of reduction measures that will be taken. That is the end of this video report on the 
COVID-19 pandemic as produced by the BC COVID-19 modeling group. So stay safe, enjoy the warm weather, and I will see you for the next report video.